everyone, and welcome once again to the vast and ominous comic book vault. It's time once again for new acquisitions, and this is sponsored by Elite Comics from Overland Park, Kansas. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Dan. And, uh, Dan, we've got lots of stuff to talk about. Weirdly, um, we only have two books we both read this week. I know. Uh, I expected there to be more, but, uh... I was short on money with some of the things I wanted to try out this week, like the X-Men uh, number one. If you say good things about it, I might pick up the second issue, but... Okay, well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but we do have uh, quite a few books for you. It's just Dan and I each read different things. Uh, so, we're going to start with our uh, two um, combined books, and then we're going to go uh, back and forth through all of our other books. And, Dan, let's start off right now with IDW with uh, Ninja Turtles number 22. This is the beginning of the new City Fall event, and... And uh, we've been greatly anticipating this uh, for for months now, um, partly just because uh, we haven't had a big named event in Ninja Turtles yet, and considering this thing has been good all the time, if, if they think it's worth a big event name, I, I trust Eastman and Waltz, it's probably going to be really good. But the other yeah. thing I've been looking forward to also ever since um, the Foot Clan mini is freaking Frick, Santa Luco on this book regularly. Yeah, he's been my favorite of all the artists IEW has gotten to draw the turtles so far. Uh, he's got this really great uh, Japanese culture look to his art, and he does cool things with the turtle mask, like we had talked about when we, were, we reviewed the issues that many. I really like his stuff. He's incredibly expressive, and I'm going to go this far. I wish they would put out, like, a video game in that style. Ooh, that'd be fantastic. I just think that'd look really cool. Dan, what did you think of uh, the beginning of this? I thought this was... Uh, pretty great. Uh, I love that we're getting payoffs for pretty much everything they've been setting up for the first 21 issues. It feels like um, we're running in Brian Michael Bendis mode where every issue is really interesting, but it's all building to a bigger story, and this is the direction they've been heading since the first issue. Um, I love all the um, stuff with Raphael here. Uh, I Because they established his, him and Casey Jones' relationship as best friends and oh, the, the only one Raphael can really level with with his own personality, um, you really buy how angry he is about what happens to Casey in here and it's really heart-wrenching watching him have to you know deal with all this stuff. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I like the way uh, Waltz is figuring out how to insert characters that have been set up, but we didn't know w when they'd come back and when they'd be important again. Uh, we've got we've got Alopex back again, um, who we haven't seen do very much in a while, and mm -hmm. frankly, I keep wondering when she's gonna matter. <laughs> um, and and is and, and seems like maybe th this arc, either she's just there to be another face to get punched by the turtles, or she's actually gonna factor in more. Um, but I think given. Um, given Shredder's motivations and uh, trying to get Leonardo and all those th sorts of things, I think it's important that they have more mutants, um, you know, you know, you know, in all of this right mm -hmm. now. Uh, but it's but it's also interesting to see the uh, Purple Dragons come back. Um, that that's that surprised me, and um, I guess it's kind of maybe it's an obvious thing to do, given that this is a go rescue Casey Jones plot. I just thought of that, you know what I mean? We're like, you know, you know, you know, it, it, he and Angel are are uh, are, are friends, and um, they have kind of a bond, so it's going to be uh, important for her to be involved. But um, but again, you know, this book has a ton of characters, and given that in the first few issues, um, I think you and I both felt like it was running a little bit slow. Getting up into just twenty two issues now, with the sheer number of characters that are in this book, I'm impressed with how they're they're uh, you know balancing everybody. Yeah, I agree, and I love how they're just taking the Turtles' uh, previous stories and turning them on their heads and doing better versions of them, really, in my opinion. Like, we have the standard, like, capturing of someone the Turtles care about here, and instead of it being April O'Neil, it's standard damsel in distress plot, like we've seen a million times in Turtles things, it's Casey Jones, and it has so much more of an emotional resonance here, because I think... They always try to push this romantic thing with the turtles in April when they're trying to have a rescuer and some of the things. And I think this works a little bit more here because you buy Raphael and Casey's friendship a, a much more than I had ever bought the turtles being sexually attracted to April, um, which I always thought was a sort of weird idea. <laughs> yeah, and it's hard not to be creeped out by it any way yeah. you slice it. Um, I mean, like, there there have been so many really, really kind of, frankly, vulgar jokes made about that over the years. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> you're, you're setting yourself up for failure when you do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, the first, I don't know if you thought this, the first thing I thought when uh, Raphael and... Uh, 
and Casey both get kidnapped. Uh, Raphael gets away faster. Um, they they get tape gagged, and I was thinking Ninja Turtles two the entire time. Like I was ready I was for thinking Ninja Turtles two that, and when they do the um, amphibious assault thing, you know, at the end of Turtles two with their turtles, I mean their shells come up out of the water. I was oh, like, oh yeah, but it's like, oh that's like that. Wasn't that a great line when he's like, he's like, no, uh, I, my, Mikey, he doesn't mean that sort of amphibious. He means something else. <laughs> yeah. um, that was pretty great. Uh, the, the gags in here were really funny, and uh, so one of the start. things I wanted to mention about San Luco's art, too, yep. was um, I like that he draws the turtles looking young here. Like, they have a distinct look to their faces where they look like teenagers, where in a lot of places they're drawn, they're, they, you know, Eastman usually draws them with the grimace on their face, and they don't necessarily look young, which I suppose is fair because they're turtles. They shouldn't look like young humans, but the way Santa Loco draws them here, they look a little bit more naive and... Um, less world weary than I've seen some of the other turtles uh, drawn before. I like that about it because that's who they're supposed to be. Yeah, we need to move on. I think this is a fantastic. Okay, sure. this, this is a fantastic start for this, and um, I'm greatly um, um, recommending folks check that out. Also, I think it's a good jumping on point. Yeah, I agree. Um, you can start here, and uh, if you like big shredder plots, you know you'll get what you came for. Coming up next, Venom, number 35. Uh, Dan, can you believe that this book has ran for 35 issues without starting over yet? Because that's not happening not. very much. Yeah. I just and, thought of that. Uh, I kind of forget that this book is as good as it is every time it comes out. But I think Cullen Bunn, set, he, he's brought Eddie Brock back to the Eddie Brock that a lot of people like, just with a different color and name. Yeah. And he did it in, like, one issue better than some of the things that we had previously talked about, like Lethal Protector in the 90s. It works so much better here. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. It's fantastic. We have the uh, the threat that we originally loved with Venom uh, when he appeared as a Spider-Man villain, where he knows the hero's secret identity can pop up anywhere, and that he's never going to know where he's going to pop up. So you have that threat. He's got the lethal protector thing going on here by the end, where he comes to this agreement with Flash, like, if you lose control, I'm going to kill you. And um, it's a realistic motivation, and I really buy the the uneasy alliance that these two have here. When it, where in places I didn't in the '90s with Venom and Spider-Man, um, I don't know. Like this is like a Spider-Man comic from the '80s. That's what it reads like to me. I really like that about it. Um, Flash is a de dealing with adult problems and, and things like that, and having to form an adult life. I don't know. I, I really enjoyed this. Um, I have a complaint about this, and sure. my, my complaint about this is more of a complaint of the stuff leading up to this. It took us far too long with the toxin stuff being set up, in my opinion, to get to okay, this, sure. to, to, to get, what I mean is, to get to this issue, and then in one issue, I finally understand what the point of bringing Eddie Brock into this right now was. Um, you, you had, you, you had, maybe it wasn't as many issues as it felt like to me, but over time, it felt like a lot of... <laughs> like of of of, to of toxin. Oh no, he's gonna come in. They're gonna have a fight. Just look out. And there were there were two or three issues. I thought I think of like 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 uh, Flash not even knowing that toxin was on his way. Like like building that up a little bit uh, a little bit more than I think they needed to. I, I like what's done here. I wish this had been the last three issues. Um, I don't feel like this had to. He does okay with this in 22 pages. I think he could have stretched this a little bit, and it wouldn't have felt stretched. Um, what I mean is. I'm not sure that the that the uneasy alliance doesn't happen a little bit too fast. Uh, it, it, it for me it was like it was like um, oh no there's uh, there's bad guys attacking these kids in the school we better team up. Okay yeah I buy that but then they team up and they win and then immediately uh, uh, Eddie Eddie changes his mind about fighting Flash and he's like. Um, you know what? No, never mind. Uh, I'm gonna watch you for a while, and I'll kill you when you get out of control. I liked all of that. I liked I, I, I liked Flash saying, um, "I'm gonna want you to kill me if it ever gets to that point." I liked that we had that, and I liked the relationship we have with them by the end of this. But it, it was a little quick for me. I bought it simply because he saved Eddie Brock's life during that fight, and he didn't do it because of anything other than that's the right choice he had to make at the time and Eddie respects him because of that and um, sees a little bit of himself in there um, where he's trying to protect the innocent even if they're um, you know, sort of bad people. That's fair. I, I didn't parallels quite get that the, out of it. The alliance a little bit more because of that moment. Okay. But. I'm not 100% sure you're not reading into it a little bit. Um, maybe, well, maybe they, they not, say it but... in the dialogue. 
but okay i just didn't quite pick up on that all right whatever um i don't know i mean like i said it's good i just wish this had been the last three issues i guess is all i'm saying yeah yeah sure i mean that that's fair enough i wish we could have lived a little bit more in the status quo of like if you know the, the, the that... classic 80s venom where he's you know stalking um him and knowing his loved ones and you're not you're not sure he's gonna pop up i, I agree with you that would have been fun yeah i mean i'm just not sure they vocalize it quite quite that much. I mean, there's like a there's like a mention of, oh, I saved your hide, but, well, I guess it's kind of there. Flash has an internal monologue about making the right choice. And no, that's, that's true. Thing. I just wasn't sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking more about Eddie's motivation. Like, like I, like I'm just not sure that I buy everything Flash does. I just wasn't, a sh wasn't hundred percent sure that that that, uh, that that Eddie would so quickly um, be like, no, nah, I'm not going to kill you right now. After all, even though that's why I've been in this book for the last five issues. Um, I mean, he did the same thing to Spider-Man in a short, yeah. in a shorter amount of time in the '90s too. So maybe it's just you know. Kind of that again, yeah. Well, that's okay. Um, obviously, I, I'm I'm complaining about something very minor. This was this is really good. Um, just you yeah, said I, I really enjoyed. It. You said everything I liked about it, so I just thought I'd throw out my one probably yeah, point, yeah, sure, pointless gripe. Um, well, now uh, we're gonna go on to our solo stuff, of which we have quite a few things, and um, I am going to start this off with a new book from uh, Scott Snyder, and the artist on this is Murphy. What is his first name? I think it's Sean, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Sean Murphy, thank you. Uh, the Wake from Vertigo. Uh, this is a... This is one of those books that uh, starts out in the future and um, just kind of sets you up for um, kind of uh, kind of uh, this is this cr this is this crazy future and 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 kind of tells you what the the theme of this is going to be. Um, not not so much the narrative theme as this is a this is a book about like like nautical stuff and the water and exploring Ooh, the ocean and um so you know so it opens uh, 200 years in the future and uh you see this guy working with um a uh, dolphin with a, uh, what looks kind of like a rocket pack and um and uh the they, uh, they 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 work together and then there's this giant flood and then suddenly we're thrown back into what's what looks like probably present day or something right around present day and um, so you know there's a little bit of nonlinear storytelling here we're getting a sense of kind of where we're going um, there's there's a lot of genetic engineering stuff going on um, we're following a uh, scientist lady who it's that it's that somewhat typical thing of like uh, the the, the uh, scientist who can't get the funding that she wants and and um, be, because uh, be, because the way she does her science is um, is a little bit too um, in people's faces and the government's not sure they like her and you know that kind of thing so she has a hard time getting the oh, funding okay. that she needs and um, so uh, then she gets picked up by um, these people doing these uh, these underwater experiments that are uh, in the submarine that's way 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 further underground than or, or underwater than um, anybody should be able to go but they've got this amazing technology that they, they've developed and they have a, this whole like underwater city thing going on that is apparently entirely illegal and they're not even supposed to be there and we find out that it, at first she's told that she's supposed to go that that, that um that she's being asked to go down there in order to help them um figure out what the sound is and uh it sounds like um it sounds like a dolphin sound but it's like wrong and scary and there's something weird about it so she has to go investigate it and try to identify it uh, but then we find out that uh, that was kind of just uh, their way to get her there and they actually it, there's actually a lot more going de going on down there and that's kind of where we're left out left off at is is there there's all there's um, there's these crazy genetic experiments going on down here and what is all or it looks genetic I don't know um, and, and yeah. what, what exactly is all of this about so um yeah this uh, reminded me of a lot of things um, the biggest thing being this this felt like serious, serious sea quest. Um, <laughs> I just couldn't help but think about that because of the dolphin with the rocket pack at the beginning. Um, but I, but um, you know, th this uh, is not immediately my kind of thing. But I was certainly intrigued by it, if nothing else. Um, it really, really, just a lot of setup. Uh, it's it's very um, like kind of kind of exploration-y, you know, it's like, uh, it's like kind of the wonders of the deep, but then also there's something sinister going on with, um, it's not even a bureaucracy much as, so much as like, uh, you know, you know, um, 
uh, underground, maybe they're evil, maybe they're not, kind of, right, um, yeah. kind of, kind of situation. So anyway, um, uh, I, uh, I definitely would recommend this one. Um, I thought this was a good, th this is a, a really good starting place. I'm not sure what I what I think of it. Um, uh, you know, you know, moving forward, just because um, it was a lot of setup. So um, I don't know where right, any I'm, of it. I'm sure the second issue will be a better indicator as to how. Yeah, it exactly. Will be. It's hard to talk about because I don't know exactly what's going on here. Um, right, exactly. When you, when you said yeah. exploration, nautical things, yeah. and genetic engineering, my the first place my mind went was Wrath of Khan. Oddly enough, <laughs> <that, but laughs> that's like, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> all three of those things are in that movie, but that's not really what they're about. But I, but it's a, but it's a little more sinister. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so I uh, but yeah. Uh, uh, definitely, if you're looking for something different and for, and, and, um, for something um, Snyder that's, you know, obviously Snyder is kind of in a place where he can do no wrong right now, um, uh, you, know, you know, check this out if you're not reading, um, you know, like American Vampire or any of that kind of stuff. My uh, first solo book that I have here yes. looks to be Indestructible Hulk number 8 by uh, Mark Wade and Walt Simonson. Once again, this is Simonson's uh, final uh, issue on the book. Uh, I think he was just doing a three-issue arc. Hopefully he'll come back at some other time. But um, this was uh, really great because Mark Wade uh, basically makes a case for the way he's characterizing Bruce Banner right now in that he's not a complete cynic anymore. Um, he talks a lot about how um, being alone festers cynicism in a person and how um, companionship will breed positive uh, thoughts and emotions if you surround yourself with the right people and um, he sort of parallels Bruce Banner's new attitude with this cynical lady who's who's on Bruce Banner's uh, science team that he we had established in previous issues um, who's dying of a brain degenerative disease that has no cure and Banner's encouraging her to you know look forward to the future try to find a cure rather than um, sort of just get ready to die and she, there's this really interesting dialogue between the two of them when they're talking about um, facts and science and magic and you know since they're in the world of Thor that ties into what they're doing in Asgard there it's a really interesting um, look at that whole thing and um, it's a lot about psychology but at the same time it's got a lot of big um, ideas the Hulk gets to hit frost giants and uh, he's hitting on the things I really like about the Hulk big action and psychological themes so um, this, in my mind, is the Hulk book I've been wanting since uh, I've been, you know, reading Peter David's stuff, really. Um, this is great stuff. Uh, not that Jason Aaron didn't ta try to tackle psychological stuff, I just think he petered out a little bit in the end. But uh, this, this is really good. I, I really like this. Dan, uh, next up, I've got X-Men number one. Uh, this is by Wood and Coppell. Um, <clears throat> Dan, I liked things about this, but overall, I don't think this was my bag. Oh, that's unfortunate. I got. I got to be honest. I was hoping with you. that uh, that was going to be one that would be good, but um. What's really interesting too is that I'm not a Jubilee fan, and I thought yeah. that Jubilee was going to be the thing that would turn me off to this book, and it, that really wasn't a problem. Actually, she was fine. <laughs> um. So basically, the story here is. Uh, I, I guess I guess I just felt like this is a little bit too kind of run of the mill and typical. Um, yeah. you, you've got you've got Jubilee uh, on the run again, um, but this time she's picked up this baby uh, from like the I don't know like right outside of an orphanage or something. Um, it's like it, it's like uh, here's this baby and nobody's here to take care of it, so I'm gonna pick her up. But it is funny because she makes this big deal out of how like she didn't kidnap it. It's like don't worry, <laughs> I didn't I didn't steal this baby. Uh, so so uh, she's kind of panicking. She doesn't know what to do, but um, she starts to kind of bond with it a little bit, and she's, what's weird is she starts to kind of see herself as the kid's mother already, and she starts calling herself that, which is a little bit strange, and then she goes to the, um, to the, to, uh, I guess now we have to, dis we have to discern which school we're talking about. She goes to the Jean, <laughs> to the, to the Jean Grey school, uh, yeah. to Wolverine school, and uh, she goes there for help. Well, conveniently, um, or, or she's on her way there, I'm sorry, she's on her way there, but then she calls them, and, and, they, and they, they come um, they come to her, and um, conveniently, uh, all of the X-Men that come with her are pretty much the uh, female uh, team that's going to be making up this book. And uh, what I found a little bit strange about it was, there's not a male X-Men in this first issue anywhere. It, it, it's almost like... 
I mean, I get that this is supposed to be an all-female team, but there's no setting up of that. It's just the girls all conveniently come together and go help Jubilee, and I just I, I was I was taken out by that. Um, I felt like it was a little too it was a little too easy. Um, I was like. I, I was like, I wonder if people aren't gonna be put, somewhat put off by that, where it's sort of like, well, this is um, this is a plot about a girl with a baby, so only the women care. I don't know. I mean, like, it, it doesn't come <laughs> yeah, off that way. It certainly doesn't come off that way with this book. It, it, it seems like just conveniently only girls show up, but it, it but it seemed kind of strange to me. I don't know. Um, and so anyway, like I said, it's it's a little bit. Um, it's a little typical. Um, basically, the whole the whole idea is that um, th there's actually this entity that's in the baby that can jump to other to other entities, and um, this uh, this guy shows up who I've never seen before, but they recognize, so it must be someone. Um, that uh, that that people know. His name is uh, John Sublime. I don't know who that is. I'm not too familiar either. So um, it's probably some X Men thing we haven't read. <laughs> yeah, may, yeah may, maybe so. Um, but anyway, so like apparently um, th this girl is or th this this um, yeah this like female entity uh, that's that's like uh, energy being kind of thing um, uh, is is um, like kind of a scourge of the galaxy kind of thing, and she's going to wreak havoc and cause all kinds of problems. And so um, she's kind of jumping body to body right now. She's in this body in this body, but then at the end she jumps into somebody else's body and. I won't tell you who that is, um, but uh, I don't know. I wasn't real impressed. Um, I, I didn't get super jazzed by it. Um, and, and also, th this is neither here nor there at all. It's a little bit strange to me to have a book that's all that's an all female team of X Men called X Men, just because there's no <laughs> men there. I mean, like, not that it matters, but it's just kind of funny to me. Like, I'm not saying I, I'm not saying they should call it X Women because that would be like really yeah, gratuitous. <laughs> So I, I guess it, I guess it's fine, but but I, I guess what I'm saying is I never noticed I, I've never seen that before. You know what I mean? Like like I'm yeah. like I'm looking at a book called X Men because people have always said um, you know over the years, well why is it called X Men when there's women there? Now we have a book called X Men that's all women. I think that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting. Um, I mean, guys, it's not I, bad. It just wasn't. It, it just didn't jazz me at all. Um, it was it was just kind of a typical X Men book, really. Well, I'm going to see, obviously, when Wood does the crossover with uh, Bendis and uh, Aaron's X-Men books yeah. later on in the year. So that, I'll probably try the book out then and then maybe decide if I want to keep on it based on... Because I like Ryan Wood's Star Wars book a lot, so I was hoping that uh, the X-Men book would be as good as that. But well, Maybe um, he's got more things we'll, we'll see. You know, you know, planned for later on, but just this first... The, the, at least the setup for this arc, I don't know, it didn't really do anything for me, but... Oh, sure, yeah. Um... So uh, the next book yeah. I had was uh, New Avengers number six by Jonathan Hickman and Steve Efting, and uh, this is continuing the uh, story from the previous issues where we have this huge cataclysmic multi-universal thing going on, and the Illuminati are having to deal with it. Um, in this issue, they make this really dangerous uh, weapon that will be destroying a. Uh, world uh, that's coming for Earth, and the uh, the point at which it's going to impact this time is Latveria. So Reed Richards has to go and help his arch enemy defend his kingdom from an invading army by a mysterious um, thing that consumes planets that's at war with a mysterious guy that's the master of death. That sounds so awesome! So Hickman is seeding a war in this book between Thanos and Galactus, which is pretty cool. Oh, um, that's cool. Yes. So we have uh, all those things going on, and uh, the the New Avengers are sort of struggling with the moral dilemma of we have to s destroy an entire planet that is just an alternate version of ours to save ours. So, like, just because we're from this reality, we feel entitled and, you know, get to destroy this planet while the other people are just alternate versions of us. And um, there's this really interesting moral dilemma. All of the characters that take different sides, like Namor, is like, we gotta do what we gotta do. We can't be pretend to, you know, be superheroes when we wake up in the morning. You're not gonna be able to sleep after these things happen. Black Panther has a lot of reservations about it. He says, I'm not the man I used to be after he does what he has to do here. And um, it's left in a place where Doctor Doom, something very dangerous might have fallen into his hands, and that's always very cool to see. So I am still loving this book. 
it's fantastic, and uh, I every, every time an issue comes out, I'm jazzed to read it. Steve Efting's art is fantastic as always, too. This is Hickman at his best, I think, and least confusing. So if you like Hickman but don't like to be confused, this is the book for you. <laughs> Uh, next up, I'm going to talk about the uh, Batman Dark Knight Annual. Uh, this just um, this is uh, obviously the uh, the first annual for this book, and uh, it's my dream team still. We've still got uh, Greg Hurwitz and Simon Kurdansky, uh, and it's Greg Hurwitz using um, the two big villains he's done so far, plus Scarecrow. Um, unless he's written Scarecrow somewhere, and I didn't read that, but um, but uh, he you know he did he that. He did. I think the arc before Mad Hatter was him, and it was a big scarecrow arc. I remember okay. Shane's told me about it. See, I didn't know if he, if this Mad Hatter thing was him on the first starting the book, or if that was before, because I wasn't reading it before that. So uh, that means that it is the three big villains that he's been dealing with um, all coming together um, for cool. this one fun little story. And uh, this is completely unnecessary. This is not something that you have to read. Uh, this is a fun one-shot kind of thing to read um, that's fun whether you've been reading Kurdan Scott stuff, or Kordansky, whether you've been reading Hurwitz's stuff or not. Um, but it's also probably a little bit more fun if, you, if you've been reading Hurwitz. And uh, oh, yeah. so he takes uh, Mad Hatter and Penguin and Scarecrow, and each of them gets a card on Halloween night that claims to be from one of the other ones saying, um, meet me at Arkham Asylum, and uh, it's really ominous, and they don't know why they're supposed to meet each other there, but then it turns out that none of them set this up, and it's some fourth party, right? So they all get there, and they're all like, oh, this is an interesting setting, I wonder why we're here at Arkham Asylum, right? And uh, so they all... Actually, oh, you know what? No, no, I'm sorry. This is important. It's not Arkham Asylum. It's the Arkham Detention Facility for Youth. And uh, because the story is basically all about um, kind of how their pasts are constantly haunting them. And he brings in little elements from the past that he's done for each of these uh, throughout this. Um, that's why I was wondering about Scarecrow, because I kind of didn't think he would do this if he, hadn't, if he hadn't written Scarecrow yet. So that makes perfect right, yeah. sense. And um, anyway, so... Uh, they're they're kind of uh, going around this uh, around this creepy kind of uh, kind of old house uh, th th this this old Arkham house that um, nobody's using anymore and uh, they're remembering uh, I guess each of them probably spent time there and they're remembering their time there and they're haunted by it they're also haunted by Batman because they think that Batman sent them there uh, when when they when they all get there and they and, and it turns out that neither of them came up with this idea. They all think, oh no, Batman's going to leap out and, and, and attack us. And they keep talking about um, various Batman tropes, and they, they kind of um, wonder how Batman comes up with his names for things. And they're like, why does he call... How can he be this dark and scary, but he calls things a batarang? And you know, they, they, they talk about things like that. And then, um, I won't give away the ending and, and why it turns out that they're there and everything, um, but uh, like I said, it's, it's kind of a fun haunted house story. And... Um, and uh, it's not about Batman. It's all about them. And uh, it's it's kind of uh, not that Batman doesn't appear in it. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's fun. And it's uh, Kurdansky uh, at his best because uh, Simon Kurdansky, as much as I love his art, he's totally a horror guy. And so every now and again, um, he'll write things where where yeah, there's a little bit of a horror vibe to it. But he's he's um, like like his sensibilities might not might not be a hundred percent right for for, for something. Um, this is Halloween night in a haunted house. This is right up That's awesome. Kredansky's alley. This is who you want writing these three guys running around a hedge maze, you know? Um, and that's yeah, and, and, and sure. you get that here. This is this great full-page spread of them, like an overhead bird's eye view of them running around a hedge maze. Uh, anyway, this is this is great. This is all kinds of fun. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, that might be something I'd want to read in the future. I think you did, I think you'd like enjoy a, a lot. One shot kind of thing. I love what but, Hurwitz is doing, man. Hurwitz is is right. I'm sorry. Hurwitz is writing my Batman, man. Um, and that's that's why I've been sticking with him lately. So anyway, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I might check that out while they're retelling Batman's origin for like a year. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the next thing I have on my list is uh, Captain America number seven. This is by Rick Remender and John Rita Jr. Of course, the usual guys. And uh, this was another great issue of uh, the Cap series. I'm, this is another book that I, because it's not released every three seconds like all new X-Men, I kind of forget about it yeah. and how good it is, but uh, Remender does not disappoint. Uh, this issue kind of focuses on the term 
of Aram Zola's uh, eldest daughter, the one that was uh, sort of a little bit older than the one that Cap had stolen uh, from him at the beginning of this run and raised. Um, and they were paralleled where Aaron Zola had raised this girl as this, like, killing machine, and, of course, Steve Rogers had raised his son as this really noble warrior kind of kid. And uh, there's just this really interesting psychology with that character that Remender's playing with, again, where, like, Captain America has a conversation with her about guilt and the things she does to, like, genociding an entire race of people in Dimension Z, and she doesn't understand what guilt is. She says she has these weird feelings in her stomach, and she feels bad about the things she does to people, but because no one's ever contextualized that for her, she doesn't understand how to deal with it or what that even means. So Captain America has this really interesting conversation with her um, on a, you know, a bridge with fire under it, like in the, in the Captain America movie, which was a cool little homage to that, um, where he's talking to a Red Skull on the bridge in the movie, and um, I don't know, that was the main crux of uh, the issue, was her turning over and helping Steve Rogers and him sort of convincing her to come over to the side of uh, righteousness and good and all that. Um, I could see people maybe, maybe arguing that her turn happened a little too fast, but I bought what they were saying in the dialogue, and uh, I thought it worked a lot, very well for the psychology of the character, because Remender had been setting that stuff up in previous issues, where she had been, like, sort of sexually attracted to Steve Rogers because he was a good person, and she'd never seen a man like that before. So, uh, yeah, I'm just continuing to be really fascinated by the psychology and the parallels that Remender's making between this, like, fascist dictator guy and Steve Rogers and the notion of hope and how hard times can crush a person's hope and make an otherwise good person bad. Uh, I really like it. It has a lot of things to say about our modern times where we're a little cynical and things like that. And to maybe stand up and be a little bit more like Steve Rogers in the face of that. So I, I really like this. It's inspiring. It's everything Captain America should be. It's great stuff. Uh, next up, I've got Star Trek number 21, which is uh, dealing with the events directly after Star Trek After Darkness, uh, which is why at the top, or Star Trek Inner Darkness, which is why at the top this says Star Trek After Darkness. And <laughs> That's uh, what the sequel will be called, Star, Star Trek, Trek After, after Darkness. <laughs> Star <laughs> <laughs> and now, Star Trek After Dark. <laughs> uh, so, this uh, opens up with what seems like the Klingon homeworld right after the events of Darkness. Uh, they're basically saying, oh man, there's this guy named James Kirk, and he came right up on our doorstep, and how dare he do that? And uh, we, we're uh, and we're all sitting around a boardroom still wearing our helmets for no good reason, <laughs> and uh, we, we, uh, we better go give them that war they want. So we're, we're, all, so we're on the, the verge of, of war with the Klingons, um, which, well, you know, some people complained in the movie that that was kind of dropped in the middle, where, where you, know, you know, at the end, we're, we're told, okay, we're going to go on the five-year mission, <laughs> and what about that war that's probably still going to happen with the Klingons? Uh, just because you took out that Admiral guy, that doesn't necessarily mean that the Klingons are going to care, you know what I mean? Um, you know, they're, they're not, they're not going to care, oh, your, uh, your evil head that you chopped off wanted, uh, you know, you know, wanted to uh, force a war with us, well, we're, we're Klingons, and we don't like you guys, and we, we, we're kind of okay with going to war with you, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah. I, I remember in the movie theater thinking, well, they're, they're still going to end up having war with the Klingons. And, uh, anyway, I was really confused by where exactly, by when exactly this is set, because, um, I thought, unless I'm remembering it wrong, that when they go on the, uh, when they're sent off on the five-year mission at the end of darkness, that, uh, that's supposed to be like a year after all those events. Um, I thought, like, hmm. like uh, maybe... I don't remember, because I've only seen the movie once. Yeah, maybe I'm wrong, um, but I thought I when... I'm sure. I, but I thought when he gives that whole speech and everything at the end... Uh, uh, he, he was he was uh, he was talking. I, mean, I thought it was a year later. Um, if it if it's not okay, if it was, this book completely contradicts that. Uh, it's bizarre that it opens up with him uh, after. Um, after that whole opening scene, um, he gives the whole space the final front frontier monologue, right? And mm -hmm. then they act like he's just coming up with it off the top of his head while he's talking into uh, while he's gi he's giving a captain's log. And I'm like, I well, it's the captain's oath. Well, he called it the captain's <laughs> oath, which is already silly and doesn't make any kind yeah. of sense. But also, why are they acting? Why is McCoy acting like he's never heard this before? So there's strange things like that. Um, this tries to give us a reason for why the prequel comic matters, uh, <laughs> because it has Kirk. 
talking to uh, Robert April in an interrogation room. And uh, Robert April apparently knew everything about Admiral Marcus's plans and was part of his plans, and that that was the whole reason that he that, that uh, he tried to get the that he tried to steal the Enterprise in the first place, and that the whole idea was that he was supposed to uh, distract the Klingons on um, that planet Fadish, and the Enterprise was supposed to be bait, and then Admiral Marcus could make his plans happen. Okay. Um, oh. All right. I, I mean, I guess you couldn't have told us that in the prequel because then we would know what Admiral Marcus's plans were. Um, and then, right. and then, it, you know, April even says, uh, but I mean, it wasn't all about that. I still also was trying to prevent genocide on that planet. Um, I still cared about that. Um, this, I felt like they were trying to shoehorn all that in. You know what I mean? Uh, so okay, oh, yeah. it makes a little more sense now, but. Uh, <laughs> But whatever. So anyway, that's thrown it's a in there. Bit more than just John Harrison opening a door. <laughs> and then, uh, and then we have Spock. So anyway, uh, we have this uh, this notion that uh, Section Thirty One is still around, and they're still um, doing uh, dark behind the scenes, sinister things, trying to uh, make war happen with the Klingons, and um, which is probably going to happen anyway. Uh, and, and and that you know <laughs> that threat just because Admiral Marcus is gone now um, isn't completely gone, isn't completely subsided. So I like that, um, and. What, what I'm not, one thing I'm not sure about the, though is that in the middle of all this, they're um, trying to do their retelling of um, a mock time, and Spock Ooh, is going through Ponfar. And apparently, uh, because they never even addressed this point, apparently it, it, it's not enough for him to just mate with Uhura because he's experiencing the Ponfar. And, um, I mean, I know you're supposed to go back to Vulcan, and it's supposed to be with, like, your betrothed, if, you know, you know, Vulcan woman, but, Dan, you wouldn't know this, but there are there, there's at least one episode later on that makes it seem like it might work with a non-Vulcan, so it's weird that they don't that they don't cover that, but I yeah, didn't... Spock sort of tries to meet with a human woman on the ship in the episode, doesn't he, from what I remember? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Well, no, no, not really, does he? She walks into a room, and I, I don't know, just the way I read the scene, I felt like he was, like, you know, trying to seduce her a little bit. <laughs> um, I, yeah, but... But you got to wonder about it. You got to wonder if, right, like, exactly. like, like, why they don't even discuss it because he's got a girlfriend on the ship. It's weird. So they go to New Vulcan, and there's uh, the the woman that Spock's supposed to be, to be betrothed to. They don't give her a name, so I don't know if it's Tupring or not. Um, I don't know if it's mm -hmm. the same character. But what's weird is all these Vulcans are very openly talking about Ponfar, which bothers me because. Um, I don't know, again, I know this is a new continuity, but I don't know why the Vulcans would suddenly be that different, and they're all okay with openly discussing Ponfar. Um, yeah, the because they were to be very uptight. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, uh, uptight, but also, but also like, like they keep to themselves. They're, they're, right, not, exactly. they're not an intimate species, and that's one of the things that was always really interesting uh, about them, that, that they're very logical, but at the same time, they're not always forthcoming. There's things they don't like discussing. There's things that bother them, and actually, their, um, their logic, it makes sense that that would um, cut them off from wanting to to you know engage with people about you know you know you know emotional personal stuff because they don't want people to think that they experience those sorts of things they don't want Vulcans don't want human beings to think about Vulcans and sex in the same sentence they don't want them to think about those sorts of things because they're supposed to be enlightened and above their bodily functions f controlling them yeah those that those kind of thing. Uh, instinctual drives. Instinctual drives, precisely, and um, I feel like that's kind of that's kind of forgotten a little bit here. So um, I don't know. All in all, I'm not I'm not recommending this one. It's not bad. Um, you know, if you're uh, if you're reading the series already, or you're um, or you, you really really love Darkness, you might get a few things out of this. Um, there's some fun things here and there, uh, and they're doing some stuff with Romulus, which is interesting. Um, so I mean, like. It, it, it might be worth your time. Um, I'm not going to give it a recommend just because um, I personally uh, thought that there, there were just uh, it, it was too careless for for my taste um, with with all the story stuff. Yeah, and one other thing I was just thinking about: if they have to go back to Vulcan for Ponfar to work, they blew up in the first movie. Yeah, well, they talk about that, and then they're like, "Well, we don't have to go to Vulcan. We just need Vulcans, so we can go to New Vulcan." Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You always get the sense in Amic time that they actually had to go to Vulcan. Yeah, that's what I was thought. Although, didn't they also, in, in, in I'm, I'm trying to remember, didn't they also in that episode even even uh, uh, discuss, well, is there a Vulcan ship close? But I forget now. It's been a while since yeah, I've Yeah, I can't it. remember off the top of my head. But 
But that, anyway. That's neither here nor there. I'm just not a big fan of what they did with the Vulcans and making it less subtle than it was before in the, the new continuity. So, so I'm, I'm like this on it. Um, my next book is uh, Wolverine the X-Men number 30. This is by Jason Aaron and uh, Pasquale Ferry. And uh, this was an issue that is the uh, prequel to the big story that's coming up in this uh, book before the, the Battle of the Atom crossover, which is the uh, Hellfire Saga. And this basically sets up uh, some of the students of the Jean Grey School uh, defecting to the Hellfire School as undercover agents for the X-Men and not telling the teachers about it. Oh, wow. Um, they're wow. just sort of doing it on their own for their own reasons and their own goals. And um, uh, it's really interesting. Uh, Aaron has this thing here where, like, the teachers sort of feel responsible for um, the, the uh, kids going off and doing all these rebellious things where it's not like that all for the kids, it's for their own personal reasons. I think there's a little bit of commentary going on there about who to blame for a lack of education or disinterest in education, the teacher or the student. And I think that's a really interesting thing to bring up in a book that's about people going to school. Um, it's a very relevant topic, obviously, for today's world, and I appreciate it. It's not like a big commentary thing in the issue, but it's, it's in a few scenes there and um, he doesn't make a deal about it. It's much more about setting up the plot and the characters uh, for this upcoming arc. But I liked that about it. Um, the other subplot we have going on here is uh, Brew, who is the um, the brood uh, little character who had been shot in the head. And he was atypical to most broods in that he was intelligent and was very well spoken. And after getting shot in the head, he's not like that anymore. And a beast is trying to bring him back to the way he was before. And that plot intertwines very hilariously, actually, with the plot that's going on in the X-Men school because they have a teacher traitor among them that's selling secrets to the Hellfire Club and who it ends up being is hilarious and the reasons that he's doing it is um, ties back to one of the previous issues with a disgruntled uh, substitute teacher that the X-Men didn't hire <laughs> and it's it's just really funny goofy stuff but also really uh, well done uh, grounded character work and commentary so this is uh, you know Wolverine and the X-Men doing its thing it's still pretty good um, and I'm excited for the Hellfire saga it should be pretty cool uh, the last thing I've got, Dan, is Adventures of Superman number one. This is uh, several, uh, I guess actually just three, um, little short stories um, all thrown together in one issue. And um, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, was this, this was digital first stuff, right? It was digital say, first. This stuff yes. was in digital first and then they collected it. Um, and they're doing a Batman book like that also. Um, I, I read, Legends I think, of Legends of the Dark Knight, yeah. And I, and I read one issue of that and um, it was okay with the story. I liked some of the stories in that. Um, I didn't care for this very much. Now, having said that, I think it's important to note that each issue of this, they're probably going to have three or four, however many short stories they're going to have by different writers and artists, so this doesn't necessarily mean anything for the rest of the book, you know what I mean? Um, right. So, you know, maybe subsequently they'll do things that I would like better. Um, basically, we've got, um, we've got a story at the beginning of this that's uh, about these... Um, these uh, couple of people that are um, hyped up on these drugs that it turns out uh, we, we, we find out um, Lex Luthor has put on the streets and uh, they're supposed to give these people telekinesis so that they can actually fight Superman. Now, the thing I liked about it was that uh, you actually have these, uh, I mean, I guess they have superpowers, but you actually have these human characters that um, are somewhat of a match for Superman, so, I mean, like, you know, cool. I guess that's there, and that's kind of that's kind of fun. The, I, I thought the, the uh, choice of um, putting Chris Samney on this was, was strange, because um, I thought that the story was trying to be too serious for the art we have here. Uh, that might just be me, but I really like Samney on Daredevil, and I felt like it might have been fun to have a bit more of a quirky sort of story with him, with Superman, sort of like what, he, what he's doing with Daredevil. Because, I mean, like, yeah, that book's really weighty, there's also fun levity in it, and this didn't have that. The, the, there's a little, it looks like there's a little bit of levity in the art, and it's, it looks innocent, but it's actually about people, like, you know, you know um, becoming addicted to these supernatural dr or these drugs that give them superpowers yeah. and so the, so like you know you know i felt weird reading it the whole thing just just kind of kind of rubbed me the wrong way um i was uncomfortable i guess is, is the right word and um yeah, I, I can see that um i can't imagine samney being able to make that at all fun 
<laughs> and and then uh, we have this cute little story in, in the middle that's uh, that I feel like we've seen people do a lot of. Uh, that's just uh, a couple of kids playing in a backyard pretending to be Superman versus different supervillains, and that's pretty much all it is. Just kids playing a back in a backyard, and then we we see their um, the. the, the, the their imaginations, um, you know, conjuring up different things, and they can't decide what villain they want the other kid to be, and um, it's, it's, uh, I'm not sure it's saying anything, really, it's just kind of this, this cute, um, you know, or, or isn't it, isn't it fun to be a kid and, and pretend to be these things? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've always, I've always thought that, uh, that, that what would be more, more interesting to do with a story like that is to uh, explore what children's imaginations would, would be like um, pretending to be people that seem really like like uh, like over the top and larger than life to us but they actually exist in the real world and like what that's like versus maybe you and I when we were kids playing Superman but we know Superman's not real you know what I mean um, right. you know, like, like, like that's yep. the thing I always think of when I see stories like that like, like that. and um, and the the art is um, is, is really is really sketchy and um, and purposely very strange looking which works pretty well for the story because it's kind of this abstract kind of notion but then you get to the end and you do see something that really that really is real and it is also drawn that way so I don't know um, a little strange to me uh, and then the end is um, a bizarro story uh, that was okay um, I kind of like I kind of like the 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 end of that. I mean, it's basically um, Superman trying to figure out how to speak Bizarro's language, and then um, and then convince Bizarro to leave and go do something. And uh, you know that's done a lot with Bizarro though, where Superman Superman has to talk Bizarro down by figuring out how to speak speak, speak his language. Um, these were okay. Uh, there was a lot of cute here, and then there was some, I think. Unpurposefully disturbing for me in that first story, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not recommending this one. Um, it's it's one of those things where, like like I love anthology books. I love single issue stories, and if you can tell a good story in nine or ten pages, okay. But I think it's really hard to do. It's hard enough to tell a good story in twenty two pages. Um, this felt a little bit like filler to me. Uh, Dan and I were talking about this at the beginning of the show, and I was describing it to him, and uh, he said, "Well, those just sound like backup features thrown together in one issue," and that's precisely what it feels like. It's, it's like back, backup issues, um, you know, all just thrown in together uh, to make to make one book, and um, it's okay, but um, I think I think that it, at the price point, I think most people would find themselves a bit disappointed. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind if it was, we had talked a little bit about this before, where it was like a different creator on every issue, and they get to tell a 22-page story. Absolutely. Um, yeah. that, I would be fine with that, but I'm just just not a fan of the digital first sort of format they have here where they're only giving creators eight pages to tell a story where like most of the writers that they are they are coming up today are trained to write for the trade where they're having a lot of space like six issues at least to tell their story and then you get people nowadays that can't very well write a 22 page story let alone an eight page one I, um, I don't know that's I just the way I feel about it that doesn't really interest me Format-wise, yeah, personally. I love short fiction. Short fiction is, is is my background. It's where I come from. So, um, mm -hmm. like like I said, I love anthology books of short stories, and I think it can work. It, it could work well with comic books, but I think you know you, you, you have a trade, and then you have several stories that are maybe fifteen or twenty pages. But to only have nine pages to work with, it seems like you're 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 kind of stuck with anecdotes. Um, I think I think it's I think it's very difficult to not have just kind of a fun little like oh Henry kind of story or just something kind of cutesy um, I don't know how, I don't know how you're expected to do anything weighty at all or do any kind of commentary or explore an idea in in, in that amount of time it's very difficult to do um, I'm not saying it's impossible but I also think you're right I don't think I, I don't think a lot of the uh, writers coming coming up right now are trained for that um, people are be people are trained for uh, you know the, the the four issue story arcs and um, and and to a degree the more long form storytelling uh, so um, so I don't know I I don't know why this digital this like this like ninety nine cent digital uh, first thing has gotten so popular except that it's easy to coax people into spending a dollar because it's a dollar and it sounds really cheap and then you know they read it and it's nine pages um, it's it's I mean I, I'm sure some kids are okay with it but. Um, I don't know, man. I just feel like we we're, we're doing too much of this, um, and and right. I don't, and I don't see how gonna be it's going to last. I don't know. 
Uh, because yeah. how weird is it going to be if they ever collect that in trade, where it's like a trade of like six issues and there's like four stories in each of them? This is a format you see some in annuals, like oversized books, where, yeah, where yeah, you'll, have exactly. a re you'll have a regular link story and then you'll have one or two of these in the back, or you'll have three or four of them. That's okay. I'm not saying that there's not room for this. I just think that, that, that to do a whole monthly book of it is um, kind of strange and maybe a little bit unfair to readers. Um, because, you know, this stuff... In the grand scheme, it's not like it's not like it matters. It's out of continuity. It's fine. It's, again, I'm okay with out of continuity stuff. But give us a full story. You know what I mean? Um, let people tell two or three issue story arcs. Or at the very least, give us a good solid 22 page, complete, cohesive, you know, you know, you know, story. And you can do something with that. I don't want to belabor the point, but right. I mean, believe me, I'm the first guy that would be you know in line to buy a Superman book that wasn't in 52 continuity, let alone any book that's not in 52 continuity. <laughs> But uh, I, I don't know. Just the format doesn't appeal to me at all. Um, well, uh, Dan, let's go ahead and do our favorite book for the week, and um, I'll let you go first. Uh, uh, my favorite book of the week, I think, uh, ended up being Venom. Actually, I wow, uh, this really? scratched every Spider-Man itch that I've been having since I have uh, not well since Dan Slott started writing Spider-Man. So, <laughs> wow! I'm gonna. Have uh, to, yeah, I guess I need to give that another read. It, it did not hit me like it hit you. That's I, interesting. I, I found a lot of things to enjoy about this. Um, just because, like, I don't think I've liked Eddie Brock really all that much, other than his initial appearances by McFarlane and Michelini, and this made me like Eddie Brock again. So um, I'll give you that. I'm really happy about that. Yeah, I'll give you that. I loved where Eddie Brock was by the end of it. Um, I'm gonna go with Ninja Turtles. Uh, Good choice. Great. That would have been my second one. Yeah, that was that was a great place to start this, and um, about sixty five percent of that is the art. Um, I mean, of why I'm picking it. I just think this is <laughs> yeah. this is the best art I looked at this week. Um, also, Shredder feels um, menacing in a way he hasn't before. Um, in, I, in, in, the in way Santa book. Luco draws him. Well, and also just stuff he does in this issue. Oh yeah, very um, true. I mean, he's terrifying now in a way that he wasn't when he when he started. Some people complain. I think I think you know Eric did a review um, of the first uh, couple of trades, and he he complained that um, that Shredder wasn't powerful enough and he was taken out too easily. And um, I feel like that's fixed now. Yeah, and you get a, a good look at his intellect in that issue too, and then he's that's planning right. things meticulously. So it gives a lot of credence to the character, I think. Well, everybody, thanks as always for watching New Acquisitions. Dan, thank you for joining me. And uh, we'll be back with you again next week with more comic books. Uh, have you looked at, at, at next week? Do we have a big week? Or have you, have you taken a look? I haven't yet, no. But um, I'm trying to think of things that might be coming out. I think there's... I'm uh, sure there's more X-Men. New X-Men next week. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> yes. There's always X-Men. There's those X-Men books is coming out. Well, uh, once again, thanks everybody for watching, and uh, if you're ever in the Kansas City area, be sure to check out Elite Comics in Overland Park, Kansas, and um, we'll see you again next time. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Dan. Happy reading.